I want to welcome everybody to um, the January 13th meeting of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, I want to welcome Commissioner Tierney and um, Director of Telecommunications Clay Purvis to our committee. Uh, really appreciate you both being here this morning and um, walking us through some of this information. So thanks for joining us. Um, what I'm hopeful that we can uh, get through this morning, and I know it's a, it's a, uh, it's a significant amount of information, but uh, last year um, through Act 137 and Act 154, the legislature appropriated a fair amount of um, coronavirus relief funds to support um, expanding connectivity in the state of Vermont. And um, looking forward, uh, Commissioner and Clay, to getting an update on the expenditure of those funds and um, where they've gone and um, the good work that's been done there. Um, that's one section, if you will, of, uh, of the discussion I'd like to go through this morning. Um, secondly, uh, the Ardoff auction, which occurred in the late fall, or at least the, the first phase of it, um, potentially is gonna have a significant effect on connectivity rollout in our state and how our CUDs are working around the state to accelerate um, broadband connectivity. So looking forward to an update uh, from you as to um, uh, some of the effects of that program. And then finally, I'm hopeful that uh, we can have a discussion on the connectivity initiative, which is a program that has been in statute for several years now. Um, and just as kind of foundational education for our committee um, and, and frankly an update for me as well, um, what the uh, you know what the status of the connectivity initiative is? Some of the programs that operate within that um, program uh, would be a helpful kind of refresher, I think, for the for the committee and for me as well. Um, my expectation is that um, we'll be having this discussion for at least a couple of hours this morning, and um, I think at a at a time when there's a an obvious break point, um, you know, sometime between ten and and 10.30, I'd like to take a 15 minute break for our committee just to get a breath of fresh air and stretch your legs. Um, so I just wanna give folks who are listening online as well as uh, June and Clay a heads up as to my intention to take a break at that time. So um, welcome commissioner, welcome Clay. Um, I know that the Department of Public Service has been doing Herculean work in the last six months. Um, you know, at, at, at great personal cost. I, I've, I've been in touch with um, you and other members of the department in recent months. And, um, you know, it sounds like there's been a lot of 18 hour days put in by people uh, in the Department of Public Service. Um, uh, you two particularly, and I know other members of your staff and want to uh, express my appreciation for that and appreciation for your being with us this morning. So welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Briglin, and uh, I, I just have to say um, I so appreciate your taking a moment to say that because I know from past times when you've said words like that, it's meant a great deal to my staff. Um, at the end of the day, we all do this because we love public service as much as all of you do, and nobody's looking for reward, but that kind of acknowledgement is worth its weight in gold. Indeed, there have been a very long days for a very long sustained period um, throughout the, the coronavirus emergency. And just to put a flag in it, it's not over. <laughs> it's still underway and we, none of us have an idea as to when it's going to conclude. And so with, with all of that, it's been enormously gratifying to at least be able to be working on behalf of Vermonters to help them through it. And it's been very gratifying to have you folks as partners in that process. So um, I don't know that it's appropriate, but I'm going to say it anyway. Thank you for your service as well. And to the new members of the committee, um, I look forward to getting to know you. A couple of you, I know I've had dealings with Representative Rogers and Representative Sims. Representative Aki, is it? Achi, help me out so I don't, I only blow it once. You're on mute, there we go. Uh, <laughs> it rhymes with hockey. Hockey, very good, Representative So Aki, drop then. the H, but it's Aki. Aki, very good. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you this way. <laughs> and other you. times I would sit down with you, but you'll get to know us all. 
And I think without further ado, I'm going to say, um, let me introduce Clay Purvis to you because we all know that he's the keeper of the facts and the keeper of the, um, the big ideas that he then filters through this commissioner. But um, I can't say enough about the hard work Clay's done and I know I'm embarrassing him in underscoring that, but uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I have to explain he's resolved not to cut his beard until the um, COVID emergency is over. And in that regard, he's shown greater fortitude than your chair, who was mesmerizing us with his beard last year. But frankly, Tim, I'm glad to see you've cut it. So um, the, the only comment I'm going to make as we enter into this discussion today before I turn it over to Clay is this. There are two things that have happened in the realm of connectivity uh, since we last met. One is the Ardoff auction, as you've pointed out, Chair Briglin. And secondly, the, um, the award to Starlink in the Ardoff auction, Starlink being a low orbiting satellite system that is uh, promising to bring, bring high-speed broadband to areas of the United States that just have no prospect of it anytime soon. The only reason I underscore those two events is these are things that are wholly outside the control of the state. And they are events that can happen as we plan our policies and execute on them. And so it's important to get used to how the picture forever shifts under us as we do our best to serve Vermonters in this, uh, in this very important area of public policy. So with that, Clay, why don't you start the briefing for the committee? And you're on mute, Clay. Figures, yes. <laughs> uh, for the record, I'm Clay Purvis with the Department of Public Service. Um, i just talk to Matthew real quick to make sure I can share my screen. Oh, here we go. Bear with me for a second here. Um, so I'll start with an overview of the CRF programs um, that um, we initiated in uh, the summer of 2020. Um, as you recall, um, you, you all enacted Act 137 uh, that included several um, uh, broadband and telecom uh, related provisions. And um, I'm going to start by apologizing for the dense material. Um, this is not a fun uh, presentation, but um, it's very descriptive of um, uh, what money we received and what we did with it. Um, there were several Excuse programs me, uh, that, yeah. Pardon me, Clay. Um, could you increase the magnification of that a bit? Absolutely, yes. And I did send this to Matthew, so if, if you don't have it, I, I'm happy to send it directly to you now so you can um, look at it on, on your screen. Oh, much better, thank you. Um, we started um, uh, five programs under Section 13. To do this, uh, we received um, a little over $17 million. <clears throat> the Line Extension uh, Customer Assistance Program, the Get Vermonters Connected Now Initiative, um, the COVID response temporary broadband lifeline program. Um, money was, a, we were able to spend money on the connectivity initiative, which we'll talk about in detail later. And then the Wi-Fi hotspot project. Um, in addition, uh, we received 800,000 uh, for the connected community resiliency program. This is a grant program for CRDs. That uh, appropriation was later expanded under Act 154 to 2.3 million. Um, and then Section 15 appropriated 500,000 for a COVID response telecommunications recovery plan. Um, we completed that project uh, with $475,000. Um, and um, I think many of you were in attendance at the, several, the couple of hearings that we, we held in December, but. That plan is published on our website. Uh, there's a link here on this document to that plan. 
um, that you can take a look at. And then lastly, um, uh, 466 thousand five hundred dollars is appropriated to us to uh, provide assistance to uh, public access television stations and we've done that. Talk about a, a little bit about the line extension program. Um, we were allowed to spend up to two million on this. We did put two million into the line extension program. Um, under the line extension program, any location that does not have internet service of 25.3 um, would be eligible. Um, the residents applied for the program um, we would provide them up to $3,000 uh, to uh, afford a line extension. Uh, the vast majority of line extensions um, were done through cable companies. We did quite a few also through EC Fiber uh, and Waitsfield, Champlain uh, Telecom, um, and a couple of other uh, uh, smaller providers as well. But um, many of them were done through Comcast and Charter. Um, we ended up uh, doing line extensions to um, about 260 consumers. We spent about $545,000 um, in total. Um, the biggest limitation uh, that we found in uh, rolling out this program was the time frame. Um, we issued our guidelines at the end of July. Uh, started taking applications. Uh, we received um, well over 400 applications. Um, the cable companies uh, could not promise to do all of uh, the qualifying applicants by December 30th. So it was, it was a first come first serve basis, but uh, for, for about half of the applicants, we had to tell them, we can't do your line extension by December 30th. And as you know, the CARES Act money disappears December 30th. Now that of course didn't turn out to be true uh, on December 27th. Um, uh, the president enacted legislation to uh, extend the CARES Act. Um, but uh, up until then, we had to assume that December 30th was, was the end of the line. So we're able to do 260 um, consumers um, we have another at least 200 consumers that um, we would love to be able to go back and uh, do their line extension in 2021, um, assuming we have the authority to spend that CARES Act money. Clay, uh, this is Tim. Yeah. Just, just to be clear, the, the roughly 140 applications that um, uh, were not awarded, those were for timing reasons? That, that work couldn't get done by, in time. Uh, by and large timing reasons so, some applicants were not eligible for one reason or the other um i think vermont saw an influx of uh, of people moving here um residency also proved to be um a, a difficult hurdle it's fine if you do live here but we we didn't want to wire second homes ski chalets and that kind of thing um so we limited the program to your, to your primary residence. And, yep. and um, is it clear um, that the, the 260 grants that were funded, do we have a sense as the number of addresses that were essentially crossed off the list of, of unserved yeah, it would be or two, It would be 260 addresses. Addresses. Yeah, ad yeah. So you get one line extension for one property um, it had to be on our list of eligible locations. So th these are um, these are primary resident residences that lack broadband of 25.3 today. So they, they're not business addresses. Some people, you know, wanted to get internet for their business, um, but you know they didn't actually live there. We had some businesses that we had initially rejected, and then it, we came to find out they lived at the address, um, and. Um, and otherwise qualified. So, um, you know, it was it was a lot of case by case, um, a, a lot of administrative work uh, going into uh, administering this program. Um, but uh, by and large, um, you know, we, we we got information from the cable companies or from um, the fiber providers saying, look, we can't we can't reasonably do this by twelve thirty. 
um, this is not this this is not doable for us. Um, so okay, we, we couldn't thank spend you for that. With, without uh, without that guarantee. Yep. Um, t t two hands up um, on this uh, on this program. First, Representative Sims, then Representative Yantachka. Um, and yeah, definitely just want to start with a deep appreciation for DPS and the incredible amount of time and energy you put into this and all the other programs over the last month. Um, what, what a heavy lift. Um, and so it's awesome to see that 260 um, customers were connected through this program. Do you have a sense of geographic distribution? I'm, I'm understanding that, you know, you had to be an unserved address in order to be eligible, but um, has any mapping happened to understand maybe if certain regions were better able to take advantage of this program than others? It, it, so that as we think about um, potential extension of this program, um, understand maybe what some of the barriers are to ensure that this program is um, working in all parts of Vermont. Sure. Um, I think that's a great question. So Section 13 did require us to map um, the locations that we serve through the program. So we have a, uh, an interactive map on our website. Um, I hope you can see this. Um, I switched uh, windows here. So if you can't see it, see the map, let me know. Um, and I believe that we have color coded um, so we're, not, we're not seeing a map. You're not seeing a map. All right. I guess I will. Uh, I will just share my screen and see. Uh, so we we did um, uh, create this map. I'm just looking to see if we put line extensions on here or if we have simply done it by company. Um, it looks like we've uh, just broken down things by company. So um, we'll have to get you that information uh, and, and break out line extensions versus you know the other programs. Uh, so well, yeah, I think there, there, I would say there, buying... there is a map on our website that shows uh, line extensions. I'm pretty sure because I was looking at it the other night. I just don't think we've provided it to the committee this morning. So okay. while you're giving the presentation, I'm going to check on that. And if I'm right, I'll provide a link to it. Okay. Representative Sims. There you go. Um, and, and, and as the, maybe a sort of related follow-up, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about um, any thoughts that you all had about why some providers did not participate. And again, yeah. if it, you know, was that just about timing and um, you know, capacity within the organization and access to, to materials in order to do the work or were there other barriers that we could alleviate if this were extended? So to answer your first question about what, um, what areas um, were able to take advantage of it, um, the most rural areas were least likely to take advantage of it. Line extensions work best when you're in close proximity to the end of the line um, and uh, as much as three thousand dollars is uh, perhaps to you and I, it doesn't go very far when you're building uh, broadband. So, what where I think this program succeeded was in gap filling uh, places that were close to the cable plant. Um, that you know, a, a large scale fiber build from say your CUD is probably not going to reach in the near future because they're they're not going to want to. Do, uh, compete directly with the cable company. Um, a lot of um, long driveways and other um, kind of weird situations uh, like undergrounding um, where people were technically, you know, on, on the cable route, but, you know, be, they, they weren't served because the line didn't go up their driveway. Um, those kinds of issues, private drives, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, where cities or towns where there's no cable plant, um, th those residents were not able to take advantage of, uh, of the program. As far as carriers um, choosing not to um, participate, um, uh, there are a variety of reasons. Uh, for some of the smaller carriers, uh, smaller cable companies, um, it, it was difficult for them to uh, do this by the 30th. Um, we have uh, at least two cable companies that 
um, are sole proprietors um, in the state. So they uh, are basically doing everything um, themselves. And so that became, you know, a heavy lift uh, for them. Um, supply chain issues did delay many of our projects, both Connectivity Initiative and Lee Cap. Um, a, a winter storm in December, for instance, took a lot of line workers out of the state. Um, supply chain issues um, and just getting contractors uh, available. You know, we're doing um, a lot of broadband in a very short amount of time. Um, I just don't think that uh, companies and contractors were scaled up to do the amount of broadband that um, we were asking them to do on such short notice. Yeah, no one saw this coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Mike? Uh, let's see if I can go yeah. back. Um, can everyone see this now? The. Uh, that depends what this is. This, yes, thank you. Um, I, I've gone back to a PDF uh, description of uh, the programs. Yeah, Clay, um, thank you for, for the presentation and, and uh, good to see you and June here again. Um, I realize that uh, it's a huge challenge uh, to get connectivity out to folks that need it. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, accuracy of the broadband map that you use. Uh, I know it's, uh, there, are, there are several uh, areas in my community, Shalott, uh, that indicate that there's uh, broadband going down a road and it turns out there isn't. And I'm wondering uh, what the source of the uh, information is being used uh, to produce that map. A, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, no one would be able to say with a straight face that their broadband availability map is 100% accurate. Um, and I think that producing a 100% accurate map is a great goal, but um, we're talking about 308,000 data points. Um, and we're also talking about um, data that's uh, voluntarily supplied to us. Um, so there are mistakes. We have found mistakes through the years. Um, we try to correct those when we find them. So if there are roads in Charlotte, um, please, please let us know and, and we'll look into it. Um, we, we have we have done this in a couple of areas. We'll, we'll go out and spot check as time permits to, to see what's, what's out there. Um, but the data comes from providers in a couple of different ways. We ask providers to supply um, uh, information on uh, locations that are served and unserved at various speeds uh, through an annual data request. We also use data that is um, uh, required to be provided to us from the cable company. So as you know, we have uh, regulatory authority over cable video service. One requirement is that with their annual report, every April they provide us with a, um, a cable plant map uh, showing um, uh, where, where the cable plant goes. And we assume that any location within uh, 400 feet of the cable plant um, is, is serviceable by the cable company. That's our most accurate data. Um, DSL providers, um, th their data is less accurate. Wireless is, is a crapshoot. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at who has 25.3 and who doesn't, um, the cable plant is generally the best data we have. Um, I, I doubt it's 100% accurate. In fact, we have found mistakes before that we've had to correct. Um, but it's um, it's the most accurate we have. So happy to look into it if there's a specific um, set of addresses in Charlotte that um, they would like us to review. I'll be I'll be happy to get, happy get, that, to get that information that. to you. I'll be happy to get that information to you. But I'm also wondering 
whether um, the map had any influence over who was getting the line extensions. Uh, it did in that um, you had to be at an eligible address. Um, so there were, for instance, uh, a few line extension applicants um, that wanted uh, fiber from a fiber provider. And when we looked uh, at their address, we realized that they were served by Comcast already. So uh, they had cable um, available they were served at 25.3, so they were ineligible for the program. Um, that, that's happened a couple times. Um, but by and large, um, if they're not served with cable video or a fiber to the home solution already, they were eligible for the program. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative Rogers has a question. Thank you. Good morning, Clay. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, coming in. I just was wondering of the roughly 150 applicants that were not accepted, would you say the major reason for that was that the service, the cable, the whatever provider wasn't willing to do the line extension or that it was too expensive or was it more the kind of second home piece? I'm just trying to get a sense of the relative. You know, uh, I, I really the think that the majority is, is due to the, the 1230 deadline. Oh, okay. um, yeah. This is applicant driven. So if the applicant is going forward with their line extension, um, the cost makes sense. Um, this number doesn't include people who would have liked to have a line extension, but the cost of a line extension was $40,000. So that wasn't okay. going to happen. So the app and was the applicant, the consumers or the applicant would be the company the applicant was the consumer. In, in this program the applicant is the consumer okay um which is nice because um we know that it's the broadband is going to get used by that consumer um they want it um they have a reason for having it and right. um and so we we know that it's a it's a good investment okay so that investment. number 400 plus that's already weeded out the instances in which the price was prohibitive is that I believe so, yes. I can verify that, but I believe so. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I just didn't know if there was another question or if I should. No other hands in the queue, so. Oh, I think. Sure, I do have one more, if that's all right. Fire away. Um, Clay, I believe my understanding is that um, households had to apply individually, even if the um, household and their neighbor were both seeking a line extension. Can you talk about um, how that went and if that's a, how you would recommend initiatives like this move forward or whether um, with more time it might be, um, you know, the sort of efficiency of allowing a, a road to apply together as one application? Yeah, um, yeah. This I would put that in the lessons learned category. Um, uh, I, I think that there was, uh, from our standpoint, there there was uh, quite a bit of uh, herding cats. Um, we did have uh, several projects where the whole road, um, a group of neighbors wanted to apply, did apply. We were successful in in, in some of those. Um, others, the projects got big enough where the cable company said, "This is." This is a big project. We're probably not going to be able to do this by 12:30, um, but um, I, I think it success there required um, someone in the neighborhood motivated to um, go knock on doors, get applications filled out, you know, encourage participation, and I I think that that was probably challenging for uh, quite a few people. Um, uh, I think if we had more time, um, and I think we have a second go at it, um, finding some way to um, um, do some outreach um, when when someone applies, if we could do some outreach to the neighbors to see if they would also be willing to to apply, I think would be a, a good thing. Um, you know, I, I think. So, some people worked really, really hard to get their line extension and um, 
you know, I don't think it would have happened if it hadn't been for um, a cheerleader in the neighborhood. So um, I'm not sure what that would look like, but um, I think if, if we had, I say a year to do line extensions that um, some kind of structure around um, uh, building line extensions would be really helpful. If I could add to that, uh, Clay, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory of the line extension, the cable line extension rule that the PUC has is that there comes a certain point where if you have enough numbers of neighbors who want to do a build, then an affirmative obligation kicks in for the company to build a line. And so that too becomes a data point that we need to keep an eye on because now you're talking about um, neighborhoods exercising a right to draw on the, the company to do a build that is separate and apart from any subsidy that's been offered uh, via the CARES money. So it, what, what jumps out at me and I think is also something that jumped out from the emergency telecom plan is there's a great deal of consumer education that needs to happen so that folks better understand uh, what the lay of the land is that they're traversing here in dealing with uh, the service providers. They're just uh, between people not knowing a lot about the technology they're using and people not um, knowing a lot about the, the applicable rules. I think there are some gains that could be made just through consumer education. So back to you, Clay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, happy to move on, or if there are more questions about line extension. Um, happy to answer yeah, these. I have one. Yeah, go ahead quickly, Mike. Yeah, um, so June, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that because uh, a number of people on in one of these uh, sections in Charlotte that uh, tried to apply together to Comcast because they weren't served by Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom on that particular part of the road. Um, they did get together and Comcast told them they just weren't interested in doing it. So what is the threshold that, that um, you know, a number of people on the same road would, would want to subscribe to a service where the cable company would have to do it? So Mike, let me get back to you separately on that. Um, not because it's a state secret, but I'm mindful of the time for Chair Wiglin and I don't want to tell you off the top of my head, that's always dangerous. But we'll get you an answer on that. Okay, thank you. You bet. The Get Vermonters Connected Now um, initiative, uh, GBCNI, um, uh, was a program that you established, uh, I think, in this committee um, to uh, bring fiber to the premises. Um, to uh, locations that um, had unique circumstances that uh, prevented um, uh, carriers from, from serving um, to, to, I guess, characterize it best. It's a program that um, was, was helpful to mobile home parks where uh, underground wiring um, is required um, and it's very expensive. Uh, so um, we actually combine this program with the connectivity initiative um, as far as addresses that were in the Get Vermonters Connected Now bucket. Uh, there are about 322 addresses um, that we characterized as uh, GBCNI. Um, most of them uh, in uh, EC Fiber territory. So these were EC Fiber grants, um, and a few in um, uh, Mansfield Community Fiber as well. And then we have the connectivity initiative. We combine the programs, the, the total um, money we put into the program is 12 million. Um, and um, talk a little bit about um, how we, we went to, uh, through the program. Um, at, before the appropriation was made, we had um, 
collected information uh, on addresses that were of a high priority. Um, these are addresses that had students at them, um, or there was a bona fide telehealth need or remote work need. Um, we had issued a survey, we had reached out to schools. All in all, we located 7,402 priority locations that lacked 25.3. Um, and um, in our RFP, we gave, um, uh, say, bonus points preference to projects that, um, that served um, a priority address. Um, I'm going to just skip down to the table. That's the good stuff. This is a table of, um, of uh, winning bidders under the program. Um, actually, let's skip down to this table. Um, as far as what technology got to which addresses, uh, 2,175 addresses were served with fiber at a cost of about $8 million. Um, that's a that's a great data point for seeing what the cost of fiber to the premises uh, is per address. Um, Three hundred thousand to cable. We did just under two hundred addresses, and then fixed wireless. Um, you all were cruel enough to uh, expressly allow fixed wireless in the program, uh, so we we did that uh, about four million. Uh, fixed wireless locations, uh, or excuse me, $4 million for 7,000 uh, uh, fixed wireless locations. And then I'll switch back to the map. And here's where the locations are that we've served. I'll go to the southern part of the state. You can take a look at this map in greater detail. Um, the um, providers are all color coded here in the legend. Oh, all right. Clay, uh, this is Tim. I just want to um, make sure I understand some of the numbers that you just laid out in terms of the eligible addresses and the ones that were actually ultimately served under this program. Um, and I'm just going to go over a couple of these, play them back to you and make sure I understand. Um, the, the department had obtained uh, a number of addresses, over 27,000, that would qualify potentially because they were um, households that had uh, remote education needs or telehealth needs or remote work needs. And of those 27,000, roughly 7,400 were identified as being um, underserved or unserved locations. Is that correct? So roughly a quarter? Yes. Okay. And, and, and then so, yeah, farther... we married, we married our, our um, yeah, we, we married our uh, broadband eligibility data with the information that we got through the surveys in the schools. Got it. Um, so, and, and then um, to the table that you share with us on page three, um, the eligible locations that were ultimately served. Um, and, and I think you total up that column to be roughly 9,400 addresses. Does that mean we we're actually able to serve more than? Um, well, obviously, 9,400 is, is, but what does that 9,400 represent relative those to Those are, those are simply, I, I, I have uh, failed to put the number of priority addresses we've, we've actually served here. That number is actually um, a bit lower. Um, this is the total number of eligible locations. So simply locations that lack 25.3. Um, and I now realize that um, I have not given you the number of priority addresses that we've served. So um, I'm going to get that number um, uh, right now, and I will let you know when I have it. Great. Um, so, so, my recollection and again, is it was, it was about 1,500 uh, priority addresses. And um, the priority addresses you're defining as those 7,400 um, addresses? Yes. Okay, That's so correct. those are the priority addresses. And 
the 9,400 that were ultimately served through this connectivity initiative program, those were 9,400 addresses that lacked 25.3. Uh, they're not all in that priority address pool, but um, they're clearly addresses that lack connectivity. So. Right, that's correct. Okay, yep, got it. Um, I see Representative Sibelius hands up, Laura. Thank you. And I'm having connectivity issues this morning, which is why I keep going off camera. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> Plain June, I know we've talked about this, but um, uh, the VTEL, uh, which was funded previously to provide uh, connectivity to virtually every unserved address in Vermont through that 2009 uh, era stimulus grants appears here now. And I just think it would be helpful to explain why that is. Yeah, I'm gonna go into uh, kind of the history a little bit. Um, VTEL received a grant uh, during the ARA stimulus years. Um, so around 2011, uh, received a grant, um, I believe a little over $33 million to deploy a wireless network throughout the state of Vermont. Um, the, the coverage area of that network was a, about two thirds of the, the land mass of the state, the geographic area of the state. Um, as I think we found out, um, not everyone who was in that, that quote era service territory was able to purchase um, broadband from VTEL um, and um, I, I, despite um, this discrepancy, you know, the USDA, which gave them the grant, uh, closed the program out. Uh, it was considered a success by the USDA. Um, and I, I think it, uh, many people, um, uh, still could not get service uh, as a result of that. The requirement uh, of, on VTEL was that it would provide 728 kilobits per second down 200 up um, in that era service territory. And we had initially, uh, when we started the connectivity initiative, we had initially excluded locations in the era service territory. Um, but um, as the, the program requirement um, required less than the minimum for one that we ended up requiring, um, those addresses were put back on the, on the table. Um, in this latest round, we were seeking um, uh, uh, broadband service of at least 25.3 to these locations. Um, which requires VTEL to upgrade its, its system. Um, and so they are using new radios and new spectrum um, to do that. Um, to ensure that we don't have a repeat of, uh, of that, um, we required all wireless uh, carriers to do speed testing um, at each individual location that they propose to serve. Um, uh, and, and produce those results to us um, in order to close out the grant. So VTEL is doing that now. The other wireless carriers are doing that now. Um, uh, it requires them to go around with specialized equipment and sit in the yard of each uh, address and, and do speed tests. Um, they have to... Uh, Test um, all the locations. Um, if they, uh, if a speed, if speed tests fail at 15% um, or more of the locations, um, uh, they forfeit the grant. So we're not going to pay out if if a wireless company does 84% of the grant. We're not, um, we're not going to close that grant out um, for. Um, 
failed speed tests between 100% and 85%, um, we reduced the grant award by the pro rata share of the failed speed test. So if 10% uh, of the tests fail, um, then they, um, they only get 90% of the award. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Uh, just wanted to follow up just for clarity. Uh, so the wireless providers are self-certifying. Uh, if they self-certify that they are not providing service to these addresses, then their award will be diminished. Uh, if we go forward in the future in two or three years, so so addresses that they <clears throat> are reporting to have served will now show up on state maps as covered. Yes? Yes, assuming that they have, um, they have proven, um, so I would say it's more than self sort of, I mean, they, they're doing the speed test themselves, but they're providing the underlying data to us um, to show that there's a speed test. Um, our plan is once uh, all projects are closed out, uh, we will be sending mailers uh, to these addresses, um, notifying um, residents and, and businesses uh, at these uh, locations that broadband has been provided uh, to, to your location. Um, and uh, it'll provide information to go to our website to see which provider, how you can sign up, and um, if there are any issues, please let us know. Um, I think this is an important way to, um, uh, to, to make sure that customers who want this service, who've been guaranteed the service, um, can actually get the service. And if that yields problems, we'll look into it. Okay, and so in the future, if we have Vermonters who are identified as having received this service and they're unable to access this, but the payment has already been made, uh, what is the state's remedy for that? Is there any, is there ability to claw there, back? There is, so the, the grant uh, requires, um, the ones constructed, uh, the, the grant requires that the company provision service to that address for five years. So that would be a breach of, um, uh, of the obligation to provide continuous service to that location for five years. So that would, uh, I would think, be grounds for a clawback. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I should have also prefaced by saying uh, to both you and Commissioner Tierney, uh, thank you as well for all of your work. As you know, I have a lot of passion around this. I, you know, it is not around your work. Um, I, I have some concerns which uh, about these wireless uh, reward, awards that were made. Um, would you say um, in an area where uh, we've seen, in like a CUD area, like for instance, one of the CUD areas in Southern Vermont, where we've seen these new awards <clears throat> um, put in place for wireless addresses, um, would you see that that will be helpful um, at, in reducing costs for, um, for, the, for getting uh, to the last mile uh, throughout that CUD territory, or will that uh, increase costs for um, getting to the last mile? Uh, I, th I think as far as technologies that uh, a fiber to the home CUD um, is competing against, wireless is probably um, the, the, the easiest to compete against. Um, I, I think that um, most consumers, uh, if they can afford the wired option that they're being offered uh, through the fiber to the home provider, um, that they'll take it. Um, it depends on the wireless carrier too, you know, what the, what the cost of the service is um, and what consumers are doing with the, the product. Um, wireless, uh, you know, they, one way they uh, 
manage their network is, is through data caps. Um, and we, um, we ranked data caps in the, um, in the RFP, um, even, even with the kind of strikes against wireless, as you can see from this chart, it is so much cheaper to do wireless uh, than, um, than fiber to the home. Um, you know, so uh, there, I, I think there are, uh, there's an argument for and against wireless. The four is it's a cheap way to get everyone something, uh, but, you know, in the short term. The argument against wireless is if your long-term goal is fiber to the home, you are undercutting that long-term goal because you will have some people who are fine with keeping the wire. They're just, they just want the cheapest product. They don't care about uh, what, what the fiber can do. They just want to pay the least amount of money for broadband. Okay. And so yeah. if you want to roll out fiber, you are somewhat undercutting yourself in the, uh, in the long term um, by doing a, a short-term wireless fix. The second thing I would say is that this time last year, we really didn't know what SpaceX was going to do. We now know SpaceX is coming in 2021. Um, and um, that is wireless. Um, it's low Earth orbiting satellite, but um, we may find that six months from now, the entire state is blanketed with usable wireless. And so why invest in, in future terrestrial fixed wireless if, if uh, Starlink is already covering it? Um, and that might be a good reason to shift to commercial mobile wireless, AT&T, Verizon, um, and T-Mobile service, which, you know, a lot of these fixed providers aren't expanding cell service in any way. It's just, it's just home residential broadband. Um, so. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, um, I guess I gave you the opening for that, uh, which I, <laughs> I find to be a fairly alarming statement. Uh, and I guess we can talk about uh, private versus public telecommunications infrastructure and uh, Elon Musk's means of funding his travel to Mars at a later date. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have two more questions um, and I will make them brief if I may. You may. So um, I do want to just go back to um, the issue of, um, and, and I, <clears throat> this is not a trick question. We've talked about this. I think it's important to get it out there publicly. Um, I think it's no surprise to hear me say that I was quite um, distraught to see VTEL receive public funds, given their past history of performance uh, and cooperation in the state of Vermont. Um, and I think it's important to understand why they were not able to be um, prohibited from accessing these public funds. So that is my question. Could you have prohibited them from accessing these public funds? I, I think with uh, the way the statute was written, that would have been a very, um, that the statute did not foreclose the participation of wireless in the program. For the department to have prohibited that, I think would have required a basis that is founded in the public record that um, goes beyond perception. And it's important to keep in mind that VTEL, um, at least in the eyes of the agency that was administering the grant that from many people's perspective failed Vermont, the, the USDA grant, from the perspective of that agency, VTEL actually successfully um, met the terms of that grant and therefore is a company in good standing as far as the USDA is concerned. And the record in Vermont is that VTEL is also a company in good standing. If you go to the Secretary of State's office and the like, if you check their record in front of the Public Utilities Commission and the like. So I think the state would have been open to possible claims of discrim undue discrimination in uh, foreclosing VTEL. We also had an objective scoring methodology that was um, open to all. 
and um, there it, it would have. I would not have been comfortable in administering the program in foreclosing VTEL simply because it was VTEL to answer your question directly. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> I, I, to add on to that, um, uh, v, I think VTEL, uh, as June pointed out, is not in default of, of their USDA grant. I'm not aware of any, any other grant that they are uh, currently in default of. Um, Wireless. Uh, this is this is the wireless industry. I mean, the, um, over subscription is a business model that that, that they employ across the board. Um, RF is an inaccurate uh, and imprecise um, uh, tool. Um, uh, they're doing speed tests in the winter right now. Who knows what is actually going to happen in the summer? Um, Propagation maps, I think, are inaccurate. I have, yeah, I have an experience of Agreed. sitting in the uh, Craftsbury Library. I showed everyone maps of, of wireless service, and everyone's looking at their phone and looking at their map, and realize that their phone is is lying to them. There's actually cell service there. Um, you know, the, the, that that is that is wireless across the board. Before this COVID. 19 connectivity initiative, we, we never funded a wireless project to my knowledge. Um, uh, we may have once or twice and limited, um, I should think of one grant that uh, we didn't actually execute on. We made an award, but uh, it was never executed. Um, but by and large, you know, we haven't done wireless. This is our first foray into uh, doing fixed wireless. So, um, and I, I think it's important to emphasize that that's where the emergency nature of these endeavors comes back into play. And it's, you know, we talk about it now almost as if it's in the rearview mirror and it's not. Uh, we still have uh, a need to get people um, the option of service as best as we can, given that um, public health policy militates in favor of people uh, staying home and uh, you know, self-isolating. Yes. So nothing we're doing here is what you would do under more temperate conditions with uh, better resources. But what we have done under the circumstances, and I, I do appreciate the point, Representative Sibilia, that you're not taking issue with us per se. Uh, what we have done here, in my opinion, is monumental. And um, it could not have been done, but for the extraordinary um, collaboration that Vermont has seen between uh, its legislative leaders, by which I mean all of you, not just the individuals who occupy positions of leadership, and the, um, the agencies, the industry, and Vermonters themselves. So, uh, and, and, and again, where, where Clay has pointed to the Starlink thing, as frightening as that may be to some people, it is a, a reality that needs to factor into our thinking as well. Um, they, they are actually marketing a product called better than nothing service or better than nothing broadband. And um, you know, for many people that is going to hold some appeal and it will necessarily be disruptive to the strategic plans that um, our CUDs for instance are making. I think something that sometimes gets lost in our conversation is that there is, um, there is a scenario under which wireless actually complements what the CUDs are doing because the, the CUDs are looking at a, a longer term. We hope that it will be done in a fairly short amount of time, but they are still you know, going to need time to deploy and get their projects built. And in the interim, there is a solution available then if wireless is part of the picture and it also has the added benefit of being equipment that can be redeployed for other purposes if and when the business case for the wireless disintegrates because the CUD has successfully built out. Thank um, you, Commissioner. That's yeah, and I'm sorry if I'm getting off topic. <laughs> that's okay. That successfully leads me to my final question. Yes. Um, I think you've, uh, uh, to my mind, um, appropriately um, brought in the CUDs here. Uh, certainly, you no know, wireless deployed in conjunction with 
the hundreds of volunteer Vermonters who have stepped forward to ensure that every Vermonter has a broadband connection, um, wireless deployed in conjunction with those folks <clears throat> um, is, less, um, is less disturbing to me um, because I expect that those folks will have accountability to the last mile. Um, can you tell us, was there, uh, you know, as you know, we, we asked for uh, we, and put into law the ability for uh, CUDs to, um, to object um, to you. Uh, we gave you, you know, for any awards that were being made and we gave you the ability to um, overrule those objections um, in writing. I'm looking for a general answer about the level of objection um, to any of the awards that were made? Was it was there no objection? Was there some objection? Or was there a lot of objection? So my memory is, and Clay will correct me, my memory is that um, in no instance did I overrule an objection. Um, when objections were made, uh, my memory is that I honored those objections and there were objections. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. And I want to stop and say again, thank you. I know how hard you and your staff have worked and it is very significant what you have done in, in terms of short-term access. My concerns are around the long-term consequences of some of those. It does not uh, take anything away from the heroic efforts and time that you all have put in. So thank you. Oh, our pleasure. And I think it also bears, it, there's a nuance here in the conversation that we need to be very clear about because some folks may lose sight of this. All of the work that we've done has been about making the internet available, accessible to people. It has not necessarily been ensuring that they personally take the service and are connected. And I just need to be sure that people understand that. There, there is an element here of choice. People at the end have to decide to take the service or not, so. Representative Sims, did you have a question? I do uh, have a few, thank you. Um, uh, and, and appreciate uh, the commissioner's comments there at the end. I, I would also maybe add to that, not only choose to take advantage of it, but also have it be affordable um, so that they are able to take advantage of it. Um, and also just really ap appreciate the discussion around this tension around, um, you know, long-term network building, short-term wireless, and, and you know, share some of the concerns around that tension. Um, and I think that's always been there. And I, it, it feels like the CRF funding and the short timeline added a layer to that because it was much easier to deploy wireless than to um, do fiber uh, to the premise in, in such a short amount of time. Um, you know, and, and, and appreciated the flexibility um, in the awards of the funding to help some projects happen up here um, to serve more Vermonters um, who, you know, and, and, and it seemed like in many cases wireless was, was the only option that could be completed in that short amount of time, but share those concerns around whether it undermines um, the long-term build of the network. Um, my question is um, around open access in this case. So, you know, this is the distribution of federal th through dollars through the state to for-profit providers. Um, and I guess would love to hear some reflections on any um, discussion around whether to have an open access requirement for um, for-profit private companies who are utilizing um, federal and state resources um, to, to build networks. Uh, so the, the, the idea there is that if you take our money, you have to make what you build with it open access and that available on a non-discriminatory basis uh, uh, to, to competitors. Um, this has been an idea, I think that's been uh, bounced around in the past. Um, I, I think my, I, my personal opinion of open access requirements is that it greatly diminishes the number of projects um, that you're that that you're going to get from providers. I, I don't think that providers, even CUDs, um, 
um, are going to be excited to um, take a significant business risk to deploy broadband in an area where the business case is already at best marginal, um, only to have um, competitors um, be able to come in and, and compete with them using their, um, their facilities. So if, if the objective is to get, you know, projects out there as quickly as possible, um, I think that that would have been um, something that would have, would have cut against us. Um, it would be interesting, uh, I think, to hear perhaps ValleyNet or um, uh, Consolidated's um, kind of view on, on what they would do uh, with such a requirement. Um, I believe that we would, we, we would probably lose um, some bidders uh, um, with such a requirement. And I don't know that, um, I just don't know how successful the program would be. I think I would add to that something different. <clears throat> so Clay has given you um, a perspective that's informed by the significant tenure that he's had in the field. And I think he's right. The thing to do would be to have representative folks from the industry in and also from the CEDs to have that conversation about what the public policy stakes are around open access. Um, that said, again, um, for purposes of dealing with an emergency, the, the priority from my point of view had to be on getting as much connectivity out there as possible in a very short period of time. And that did not permit for uh, the debate that should be had about whether one should attach open access requirements to um, public funding that the state controls. Um, though there's a, a legal issue there that I think uh, bears investigation, which is the degree to which the state can impose conditions on federal funding. Sitting here today, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but certainly if you are talking about the use of state funds, um, I, I have to think that the, the legislature has greater, uh, enjoys power to determine how its money is going to be spent. And then there really ought to be a ro robust discussion about what it is that's being achieved by having an open access requirement, because it certainly is intuitive to have that requirement if you are viewing the network as a public act, um, a excuse me, asset. Um, it, it does run counter to this infrastructure being um, deployed and managed in a competitive market environment. And it's significant that the federal government, which at least for now superintends that competitive market environment has not seen fit to impose that requirement. That's really the rub. How much can a state countermand in an area where the federal government has preempted? There there's also um, there's also a history of open access with the 1996 Telecom Act. Uh, it imposed um, wholesale requirements, i.e., open access requirements on um, on the largest telephone companies. Um, and, and you may have heard of the concept of unbundled network elements. So. Um, companies like Consolidated or Verizon or um, Windstream, the, the old uh, R-Box um, were required to um, hold out facilities uh, on an open access basis and allow their competitors to buy them. Um, and a lot of, uh, a few broadband providers bought, um, you know, the last mile loop or other um, uh, other uh, network elements, um, or lease them from uh, the telephone company at um, at wholesale rates, and these rates were regulated by the PUC and by the FCC, uh, PUC in every state and, and the FCC. Um, but competition that died on its own. Uh, and competition uh, really became between different technologies. 
Uh, so different facilities-based providers were providing uh, competing services. Cable companies were competing using cable plant, wireless companies using their, their own wireless networks. Um, and you didn't really see um, uh, startup companies um, leasing um, last mile loops to, to, to provide competitor DSL um, in, in the uh, incumbents uh, network. And, and just one, um, thank you for all that. Just one, one final, just wanna confirm my understanding that all of the connectivity grants have been completed because of the timeline of that funding. There's still a phase of ensuring that the level of service um, expected is being offered. And then there's an ongoing commitment to continue to serve those addresses for five years. Is uh, that no, uh, several of the projects are still undergoing there, is an, there was an exception to the, the CARES Act um, for supply chain issues. So you could continue incurring costs in 2021 due to supply chain issues. With the federal extension, that's no longer an issue. Um, but um, several companies um, were experiencing those kinds of supply chain issues um, and were not finished with their projects. Uh, many of them have finished. Um, many of them are very near completion as of 12:30, so we're we're working on putting together a list of, um, uh, of where where each um, provider is. Um, just to name a few that um, are done deploying, VTEL is done deploying. They are um, doing their verification. Um, uh, Waits Field, Champlain Valley has done most of their projects. They had different projects that they finished. Charter's finished, Wireless Partners is finished, EC Fiber and Franklin are finished. Um, that leaves the remainder of, of these companies are, um, um, are still in progress. So um, the, the timeline did prove to be an incredible challenge. And thankfully the, the federal government has extended uh, the timeline. It's, um, we're just now dealing with the, the state sunset provision. And you fully expect all the projects to be completed by that revised timeline and they'll be- Oh, ab absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I think most of them are gonna be finished this month or next month. So Clay, why don't we, um, why don't we get through uh, the remainder of your memo? I think you've got another page or so sure. to go and a couple of programs. And one um, data point I think I'd like you to share with us at the conclusion of this is how much money remains unspent, unexpended um, out of this, um, okay. out of the appropriation from these programs and um, what the status of that is. And then we'll take a break before we move to the second half of the testimony. Absolutely. Um, Broadband subsidies, someone mentioned affordability. Um, we created a temporary broadband subsidy program. Um, and I'll just, I'll be quick about this. Um, we, uh, given that the department was doing an arrearage program for electricity and gas and other and telephone, other utilities, uh, we decided to piggyback on that program uh, and offer a subsidy um, more or less in the same format um, unlike the arrearage program, you didn't actually have to have a broadband arrearage. Um, we just provided a $40 a month credit to eligible applicants. Um, eligibility uh, depended on um, uh, having a, a COVID-19 related hardship, such as loss of income due to uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, we ended up giving uh, subsidies to 2,935 applicants uh, and spent uh, $921,000 um, so far on the program. Um, I believe there are still a few applications that have um, been awarded but not processed yet. So I imagine that that number um, is going to increase a little bit, but that is the spent to date amount uh, for um, the broadband subsidy. Um, we had devoted 3 million to this program. So there was two million left um, um, at, at the end of it. Um, so it, it, in, in our eyes, I think it was underutilized. Um, uh, with that said, 
there's now going to be a national broadband subsidy program um, and Congress has devoted 3.2 billion to that. So um, that is uh, supposed to take effect in March. Um, we'll see where, um, what the rules are for that and, and where that uh, will take Vermont. But uh, I liked this program. I thought it was a good program. Um, it helped um, 3,000 people. Um, many of them expressed their gratitude. Um, it kept service on for a lot of people. So um, this is our first attempt at a, uh, a broadband subsidy program. I think if we got to do it over again, we would do it differently, but um, it, it was, um, I think it was a, a good first take. Um, this is the COVID connected uh, community resiliency program. Uh, this, uh, these were grants made to um, uh, CUDs. Um, we uh, obligated um, just under $1.4 million. Um, you can see what we gave out the CUDs here. Um, I think this would be more appropriate if Rob Fish uh, went over this material tomorrow. Um, he can tell you exactly um, uh, what each CUD did uh, with, with their grant. Um, there was 2.3 appropriated for this, so there's still um, about 800,000, um, more than 800, about a million uh, left on the table for, um, for that program. Uh, and then Wi-Fi hotspots. I know this is not the legislature's favorite, but we did continue with that program. Uh, here's the map of uh, the Wi-Fi hotspots we ended up uh, deploying. So um, you can take a look at that. Um, what's left, I don't have the specific numbers available. Uh, it's about 3.9 million though. Remarkable. I can get you those numbers. Uh, Mike, did you have a question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, going back to the uh, broadband subsidy, Clay. Um, yeah, is that a, that's not a program that was specifically called out in the appropriations we made with CRF funds, right? Uh, it was. Um, we were allowed to do a COVID response temporary broadband lifeline program. Um, we took lifeline out of it because that's. Um, you know, that's okay. So you said a trademarked was, FCC program. We didn't want to confuse people. Right. So you said it was underutilized. Uh, I was wondering, how, how did you get the information out that people could apply for this? Um, uh, several ways. Uh, we advertised it. Um, the carriers uh, reached out to folks who um, they ha had an arrearage. Um, we worked with the, uh, the CAP agencies um uh we had um material on the the state's um you know main covid response page um we did uh front porch forum ads as well and was this a case where you had to be uh at least 60 60 days overdue in your payments uh that would be the electric gas arrearage program um, you didn't have to have an arrearage of any kind to take advantage of this program. Um, All right. Just uh, meet the eligibility requirements, such as an economic hardship due to the COVID-19 emergency. Okay, so, so when this new um, federal program rolls out, you said it was 3.2 million? Billion. Oh, billion. Okay. Uh, what three, what yeah, right, right here. here. Um, I don't think that there's going to be, uh, it's not going to be divvied up by states. Um, it's going to be run by the FCC through its contractor, USAC. Um, and USAC will in all likelihood run it the way they run the current Lifeline program. Um, state providers will have to um, agree to um, provide the service and um, Customers will sign up the provider and take uh, a credit on their um, on their bill, and, and the provider will uh, receive that credit from from USAC. Um, just the way I I imagine it'll work the same way 
uh, the Lifeline program works today. The reason I say imagine is because the FCC hasn't written rules on the program yet. Uh, so there are a lot of open questions uh, as to um, who's gonna be eligible, how they're gonna verify eligibility, how they're gonna verify uh, provider uh, participation of the program um, and, and uh, issues around auditing. With, with the traditional Lifeline program, the state has a role uh, in designating eligible telecommunication carriers. So that means designating the carriers who can participate in the program. It's unclear at this time whether uh, the state PUCs will have that same um, uh, authority, responsibility for this particular program. So I guess I'm wondering how people are gonna know that they could take advantage of this or um, uh, you said the eligibility requirements still have to be defined. Uh, is that gonna be a function of the, um, whatever that government, federal government agency is that you mentioned or uh, is that gonna be a state responsibility or? Uh, it'll it'll be it's an appropriation directly to the Federal Communications Commission, so the FCC will determine eligibility um, based on the appropriation. USCC. Um, it, it, they've issued a um, uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking um, already. They issued it last week, so um, we we plan to comment on that uh, in that proceeding. Um, but it'll be ultimately up to the FCC um, how it's rolled out. And that will get pushed okay, out through you. customary channels. Uh, the Lifeline program that exists now at the federal level, Mike, that gets pushed out through the, the carriers and also through uh, agencies like mine um, in their you know, consumer education uh, channels. So okay. that's how you can expect to see that out there. Right. Well, Economic services has a role. Um, yeah. Carriers have advertising obligations that they have to meet uh, to maintain their designation. Um, so um, in, in, a in all likelihood, um, kind of follow that same path that the Lifeline program is following. So I, Mike, you, M Mike, I would suggest that you bookmark that question. We're gonna have consolidated in uh, on Friday this week. I know that those folks are thinking about this program even though it hasn't been fully rolled out yet and other providers that we'll be speaking with in the coming weeks, I'm sure also are gonna have um, views on the utility of this program, how easy it's gonna be for them to use. And um, so I, 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 again, I would say that you should bookmark that, that question. Um, Clay, you had presented, uh, I think, to the Joint Information um, Technology Oversight Committee a document back in December that basically was a table that showed, um, of all these programs you've talked about today, which ones had unexpended money. Uh, it totaled up to, I think, about $3.8, $3.9 million. Yeah. Um, th that might be a document that we quickly refer to when we come back after our break. Um, Matthew, sure. I, I'm, I'm going to suggest we take a break right now until 1035. If, uh, if members and guests uh, want to mute their, um, uh, mute their Zoom rooms and uh, turn off their cameras, and uh, I don't know how you put us on pause, Matthew, but why don't we reconvene at 1035, and um, we're on break right now. We're going to start up again. It's now 1035, and uh, just in the last uh, 30 to 45 seconds, I was asking a question of the commissioner with regard to the um, $3.9 million of unexpended funds from Act 137 and Act uh, 154. The bulk of those monies were in the line extension program, uh, the, the um, broadband subsidy program, um, and there was also some money in the um, uh, in the, in the uh, pool of funds that was dedicated towards um, CUD infrastructure and planning. But I wanted to get clarity on what the path is for those funds now. Do they come back to the uh, state to potentially be reappropriated? Um, and uh, anyway, I'll, I'll give June, you and Clay a chance to um, answer that. 
Yeah, so that falls into my bailiwick, and I, I'm afraid I don't have all the answers. I can only give you the insight into what I, the part that I'm able to see. Uh, within the administration, I am certainly advocating for this money to be left for its intended purpose. The only reason why uh, it hasn't been expended is, um, the main reason it hasn't been expended is because of the time cliff that has since gone away. Um, the, I hedge on that just a little bit because when it comes to the broadband subsidy, th that was a bit of a surprise to me that we didn't have the uptake I anticipated. So, uh, and now with the federal program coming through via the FCC, um, I think uh, that may be ripe for reconsideration. It's not clear to me though that I'm actually going to be able to keep that money um, because the administration is looking at its options. And of course, as you know, uh, you folks are having a discussion as well. And I really don't have any visibility into that except to say that uh, to my knowledge, the, the folks I've been dealing with on CARES Act money who were proponents of these appropriations, both in the House and the Senate, remain supportive of seeing uh, this money dedicated to that purpose. But um, you know better than I what the vagaries are that attend the reappropriation process. So long way of saying it's entirely possible that the money will revert for completely different purposes and um, remains available for expenditure by the state through December of uh, 2021. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we're, uh, I would like to shift the discussion now to, um, to Ardoff, um, but I just wanna confirm uh, with you, Commissioner, and Clay, or other members of the committee, if there are any questions, final questions we want to cover before we move away from uh, Act 137 and, and Act uh, 154. And if not... Um, Tim, the, the only question oh. I have is, uh, as you know, we've been talking about the sunset provision in Section 13 of Act 137, and I, I had some... Um, emails that I traded with Maria last night about proposed language, but I've lost the thread as to what the status of that is. If, if you know, that would be great. Yes, so th that's not something um, that our committee has uh, discussed yet. There was um, some kind of back and forth amongst uh, the committee chairs of jurisdiction about the sunset provisions um, on that connectivity initiative program and how to, uh, how to deal with that. That is still, kind of a, a, a work in progress. Um, and, um, you know, it'll probably take 10 or 15 minutes to go through some of those issues right now. And I'd prefer not to take the time to do that as important as that issue is. Um, but I think uh, between the joint fiscal office um, and uh, some of the Senate committees and house committees involved with that, I'm hopeful we have a path to make sure we're um, on terra firma uh, on that. So um, so let's move to uh, the ARDOF program uh, right now. And uh, I don't know if, if Clay or, or June, you're gonna take the lead on that, but I'll hand it, hand it back over to you. Uh, I would ask Clay to brief the committee on it. Uh, and I think sure. we have a map for it, don't we, Clay? We do, and I'll, sh I'll share my screen Great. again and we'll put the map up. <clears throat> I, there's just one thing I want to say about this, again, to reiterate, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund was set up by the, the Federal Communications Commission, the federal agency of jurisdiction over telecommunications matter. And this is something that is wholly outside of state control. Uh, they set the rules. Um, they make the decisions about how to disperse uh, the funding that's available for rural uh, digital um, deployment meaning connectivity. And we at the department have um, <clears throat> taken every opportunity we've had to advocate on this front and to impress upon the FCC uh, the need to better partner with the states uh, in order to um, make sure that these resources go where we think they're needed. Um, as the, the FCC has been very gracious in making itself available to be heard by me, um, or better said, for me to make myself heard but it's important for you to understand that we are reporting um, a state of facts to you here. We are not reporting to you policy preferences that the department has or that the Vermont legislature has. This is a reality of federal preemption and we, we need to work with it. So go ahead, um, Clay. 
Thank you. <clears throat> so as, as June said, the Rural uh, Digital Opportunity Fund um, is, a, is a program established by the Federal Communications Commission. Um, the program is funded through the National Universal Service Fund. So if you look at your telephone, you'll see uh, a, a charge um, levied by your, um, your provider for the USF um, and that uh, money uh, gets spent on several programs. This is one of them. Uh, the, the commission set, uh, set up RDOF uh, into two phases. Um, phase one, uh, they are proposing to serve uncontaminated census blocks. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. And then phase two um, will be the contaminated census blocks. Uh, a contaminated census block um, is a census block that has uh, one location served by a provider at 25.3. So the way F the FCC does mapping, a little different from the way we do mapping, they don't use individual locations, buildings. They don't look at individual locations. They look at uh, these things uh, called census blocks, which are these um, uh, geographic territories established by the Census Bureau for taking the census. Um, and they don't, they don't look the same. They look like what you see here, blobs. Um, how the Census Bureau determines what the blobs look like, I don't know. But um, there are about 15,000 census blocks in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> and providers were encouraged uh, to bid on individual census blocks um, to provide service. Uh, so phase one were the census blocks where there's no provider doing 25-3 whatsoever. Uh, because their mapping at the FCC is so bad, um, they've decided to punt on how to serve the contaminated census blocks until they figure out mapping. And the uh, recent COVID relief bill passed by Congress this past December uh, provides the FCC with $65 million uh, to fix their mapping. Um, so they, they now have the money to implement um, uh, a program to um, do a better job mapping. And once they finish that, then they will, um, they will attempt uh, to serve the contaminated census blocks. Um, <clears throat> the, the phase two will take place in uh, year six through 10 of the program. So we're going to be in phase one for the first six years. Um, so this auction that happened uh, this past October um, uh, was just for uncontaminated census blocks across the country. Uh, and here are the results. And I'll scroll down so you can see the legend. I provided this map uh, to Matthew as well. So um, you should have a copy of it. If four companies. Um, CCO is Charter or Spectrum. Um, Consolidated Communications took the lion's share. And then NRTC Phase One is a consortium of, uh, of electric co-ops um, along with uh, our CUDs. So there's, there's a, a, C, a successful CUD um, uh, bid here. And then Brown is uh, the SpaceX. Um, so uh, you can see that. SpaceX um, got little bits and pieces um, of the state. And if, if you look at the national map, they got little bits and pieces of uh, one of the biggest winners across America with about $800 million uh, in, in direct support. Um, <clears throat> SpaceX is going to be doing satellite. So Sorry, it's telling me the connection is unstable. Uh, uh, the CK reference to companies that would provide gigabit service. So um, both Consolidated and the NRTC consortium bid in the, uh, in the gigabit uh, tier. So they're going to be providing fiber to the home to these areas. So the blue and the green areas you see here are going to be fiber to the home. Um, 
and I'll just scroll down to Southern Vermont so you can see what Southern Vermont looks like. Um, that middle area between uh, Brattleboro and Bennington um, is gonna steal a lot of fiber to the home. Um, and then in Northeast Kingdom, uh, things are interesting because both consolidated in the consortium um, uh, were bid heavily and, and were winners. So um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how these networks are deployed to meet um, meet the requirements of the program. Um, the uh, the bidders have six years to deploy service. So um, this will be um, likely rolled out in the next. Um, obviously six years, um, uh, hopefully we get it before then. Consolidated, uh, when it did CAF2, uh, did complete the projects ahead of schedule. So um, we may have that to look forward to. Um, it should also be noted, um, I guess, uh, also put this in the category of things we, we don't really control. Uh, consolidated is, um, making a substantial private investment in fiber to the home. They're going to upgrade 200,000 locations across the state um, with fiber to the premises um, outside of this program. Uh, that'll probably be largely uh, um, an overbuild of, of the cable network. So they'll be competing directly with cable companies, um, but that is going to um, occur over the next five years and will dramatically increase the number of locations in Vermont that have access to fiber of the home. Um, so uh, between those two things, um, <clears throat> um, we're going to see an incredible amount of fiber being deployed in Vermont um, over the next six years. Um, also wanted to point out that, um, let me go back to Um, how do I stop, stop share? I go back to um, my document. Uh, should we go to this one? Um, I'll talk about the connectivity initiative in a minute, um, but uh, I did want to point out one important. Um, uh, facet of, of RDOF. <clears throat> I'll just share my screen here. Um, as you know, this time last year, we had mapped 69,899 locations uh, that lacked um, broadband service of 25.3. Uh, we served about you know 9,000 of those locations uh, our office is proposing to serve 19,000 locations. There is some overlap, but when you take the two together, we're going from 69,000 locations unserved at 25.3 um, down to 46,558 locations that lack 25.3. So just in the past year, um, we're seeing uh, funded solutions in place that um, take care of um, uh, about 20,000 locations, um, which is um, a significant dent in the number of uh, locations that lack 25.3. Clay, just to be clear on that, the, the, the RDOF addresses that you're including in that will, um, the, the funding and the building requirements for those go out to, what is it, 2026 or 2028? So it's, it's not as if those addresses are gonna be served uh, in the next 18 months. That is correct, yes. Um, and um, certainly that's going to leave people waiting for, for many years uh, to get fiber to the home. Um, however, with 46,000 locations, um, if the state is looking for a place to park um, scarce resources, it may want to consider that there is a federal, uh, federally funded solution for uh, those addresses and um, focus on the, the ones that um, these 46,000 at best will see something from the federal government um, in year six through 10 of that program. So their, their horizon is a lot farther away than, um, than RDOF. 
And then the other is, you know, SpaceX is not gigabit service. So to the extent that um, consumers remain unsatisfied with wireless, um, some of those locations uh, might be right for um, a re-review of uh, um, under our mapping program. So Clay, this is more of a this is more of a rhetorical question because uh, I, I know the answer to it. But um, you know the the, the Ardoff Award uh, Ardoff Awards that Vermont has received or that the providers have received to service these uh, many of these are, are are quite remote areas. Um, it it it, it uh, to say the least seems to be a double edged sword. Um, you know these are areas that uh, will. Um, you know, benefit probably much more quickly than they would have left to kind of, you know, dangle at the end of the line. Um, so, so I think that's very helpful for these um, specific areas in the next five years. You know, the challenge is overlaying a map of our CUDs and the work that they're trying to do um, in a parallel process to how some of these ARDOF awards um, have rolled out is the real challenge that um, there is either, uh, you know, parallel work going on at the same time, or some of these census blocks are going to make the work that CUDs um, have in front of them less economical and make the business model that they are trying to unroll that much more challenging. And um, so, the rhetorical question I have is, you know, what ability we have as a state to coordinate the work. Um, between some of these private enterprises and partnerships with the work that we're really trying to support and accelerate through the CUDs um, who have the, the, the mission of universal um, access to, to broadband connectivity. Um, you know, the challenge is we, we have different programs going on here without coordination. And, um, you know, is there a role for... Um, for the state, whether it's DPS or another entity, um, and policymakers to you know to to roll some of this uh, some of these resources together to try and get to the end goal, uh, which in my mind is universal connectivity, as opposed to a patchwork um, program. Sure, um, I think that's a, a good question that has a, a complicated answer. Um, I think at the very least. Um, the state should continue to recognize the locations that don't have federal funding coming at them. Um, there will be people left behind. I'm looking at the map and I am a person who's left behind. So please do focus on that 46,000 um, because I, I need service too, where I live. Um, so, um, you know, th that, is, that is one thing. Um, to, to focus on because state resources could be uh, used to, to fill in that gap. Um, the other is uh, when you talk about providers, you're really talking about consolidated because consolidated here is the largest winner. Um, they are um, getting kind of the largest amount of um, CUD territory um, outside the Northeast Kingdom and even in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so if you look at, for instance, Southern Vermont, you know, that's a good portion of Deerfield Valley. Uh, I think the question is, is there a way for the CUD to work with Consolidated um, to fill in those gaps and create um, a single network that is beneficial for both the CUD and for Consolidated? Um, or um, is there room for another provider to um, infill? Um, I think when you look at Consolidated's private investment, um, you know, that it's going to make the business case for CUDs to eventually get to cities such as Brattleboro, Bennington, or Montpelier, um, even more difficult um, because you're not just talking about rebuilding cable, which is, is a um, uh, difficult prospect, but they've already, now they've got fiber to the premises there. So you're providing a redundant fiber um, uh, connection, or not a redundant, but a second fiber connection, um, which is great for competition, but 
um, I think the question is, is there, is there enough room in these towns for, uh, for the two of us? Is there enough room for uh, both consolidated and uh, uh, the CUD? Um, and uh, I think that um, CUDs may want to explore, you know, the kinds of partnerships that, um, for instance, New Hampshire has, has undertaken um, uh, to make sure the entire town is served. You know, looking at, for instance, Stamford, um, it's still a question as to whether the rest of Stamford will get uh, fiber to the home or not, um, or Poundle, for instance. Um, uh, I would hope so, but we don't know. And and CUDs, you know, will be in a good position to um, work with consolidated to uh, work with or against consolidated to ensure that those locations are best served. Um, Can I add to that, uh, Chair Berglund, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. I, I think this is a useful moment to to note that we're not talking about coordinating in the sense of giving an individual a mandate to go out and make these people work together. We're talking about coordinating in the sense of diplomacy, um, getting people to work together and collaborate because you have to recognize that the market players here don't have an obligation to take their cue from state officials. This is a free marketplace that is not subject to the state's regulation. So the art is to influence, it is to foster collaboration and communication. And one of the things that I start thinking about as I look at the results of this auction is the, the role of CUDs, which you know, six months ago, eight months ago, I, I looked at very much as these are the people who are devoting enormous amounts of time and resources, uh, all voluntarily, by the way, um, to plan, to, to survey their communities, plan how to help their communities, and to prepare to build to help their communities, and to organize the operation of what they build. They effectively were, were going to be small EC fibers. But another uh, theory or way of thinking about it is those CUDs do most of that and partner with uh, a consolidated, for instance, um, to where the executive pieces of that, the building and the um, operation are perhaps with the market entity as, as opposed to the CUD. This is the model that, for instance, has worked in uh, Massachusetts, I'm told, though we can have a discussion about whether what Massachusetts achieved by way of its broadband vision is necessarily what Vermont wants. In Massachusetts, in many parts, uh, the state was satisfied to offer 25-3 cable connection, which is how they got to their near universality in Massachusetts. That is not what Vermont has been aiming for. But you know, my larger point here is that whatever our goals are and our conceived idea of how we're going to get there with CUDs, it has to be done in recognition that we're relying on persuasion, not direction, if we're going to partner with these uh, entities. Thank you. Um, Clay and June, we've got three hands up. Um, I want to first go to Representative Rogers and then uh, Yantachka and then uh, Sibelia. So Lucy, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I have a, a few questions about RDOF with full understanding that the Public Service Department did not create the program or roll it out, but, but may have answers. Um, I guess the first one is just more generally, is it possible to help me understand a little bit better how the census blocks are made? What, why are the boundaries the way they are and approximately how many people might be in one or another? Clear, can um, I can speak a little bit uh, to that. I don't know exactly how they're made. Um, they're small. I think what you're seeing on the map are um, some of these blobs are likely multiple census blocks uh, put together. Um, okay. So providers bid on contiguous census blocks. Um, they um, are generally have I lived in a census block with four other homes 
um, census blocks in Burlington could be, you know, two blocks large and have, you know, 5,000 people living in them. Um, you know, they, they kind of, they're, they're all over the place. I really don't know how they decide it. Um, what the FCC has done is use these, uh, uh, these blocks to map broadband. So it's, it's an easy thing for them to be able to take this to every provider and say, either do you have service in this or not? Um, I, I think where we as a rural state have been harmed is that um, the FCC has traditionally uh, considered if a census block has one address served in it, the entire block is considered served. And they've never before addressed the contaminated census block issue. And now they're being asked to, by federal legislation, uh, the Broadband Data Act uh, passed last year, uh, requires them to fix this. Um, <clears throat> so um, they're, they're trying to figure out other ways to map um, with, with the long-term goal of getting away from census blocks um, altogether. Um, so they've, they've taken comments on, on other state programs such as ours um, and how we've done that. I know June has met with them, uh, the FCC commissioners to talk about broadband mapping, um, but um, these uh, how these things are made is is, is anyone's guess. I, uh, oh, sure not a, I, well, let's to it. Well, let's be clear, yeah. Clay. Let's be clear. Um, the word census block is what it means. Uh, this is a methodology that originated with the federal census, and this is why the federal government conducts a census because it becomes an analytical tool that's used across many agencies. Um, agriculture, for instance, or education to administer funding and the like. So here you see the census block methodology of literally drawing a grid on the United States and breaking it into little tiny blocks, which as you know, because this is an exercise that was underway this year, people go knocking on doors then to take an inventory of who resides there and a variety of other information. And so the FCC borrows from that, from, from the census block maps to create this kind of, um, of lens through which to administer a program like RDOF. June, I think the word block misrepresents what they are though. They're, it, they really enough. are census blocks. Um, it's, it, 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 and by that, what you mean is it's not a geometric square or rectangle. Right, and they, didn't, they, didn't do a, they didn't do a grid, as you said, they, um, they did something else. Um, I, I, th I think the practical effect is that you could have, um, you know, uh, one street in St. Johnsbury, you know, it's some like fang pokes out into one street in St. Johnsbury, but the rest of the census block is out in the middle of nowhere and, um, you know, a provider has 25-3 service um, on that little tip, um, but not in the rest of the census block. And, um, that's where Vermont has really, um, and I think most all other rural states have really been harmed um, by the census methodology that the FCC is using. Lucy, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I do. I have two follow-ups. Um, I think that that's helpful just, you know, looking at the towns I have local knowledge of and the way it would make sense to build out broadband in those towns is definitely in no way um, matching up with, with the, the geometries of the census block. So that's that's helpful background there. Um, you kind of led into, my, my next question was about the mapping money that um, the federal government has appropriated and and you, you led into it a little bit, but I was just wondering to what extent you expect um, outreach and partnerships with the states, particularly given that Vermont has done so much good work in this area, it would be a shame to see that duplicated or to not have the federal government have the highest quality mapping that the state has worked to get. So do you right. have a sense I, of I think that the, uh, my hope is that the FCC does do that. Um, I will, to, to that point um, of, of federal and state partnership, um, as uh, tr true to uh, fashion of the federal government, they not only decided to do one broadband mapping effort, but two, broadband mapping efforts at two different agencies. And um, so they have one at the FCC and then they have another one 
at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, and that has gotten, uh, that second one has gotten uh, continuous $7 million a year appropriations for the past uh, three or four years now. Um, that, uh, that effort is uh, um, taking advantage of state broadband data. And, and we've signed an agreement with the NTIA to, to share our mapping resources. And so our map, uh, our mapping data will be put into the national broadband map that they are building. Um, it's, it's, I think, an open question as to whether the FCC will use that map in any of its future programs. Right now, it's not, um, and we are not clear yet on where the FCC is going to fall on um, on its effort to reform its own mapping um, products. I think to add to that too, um, that's where the politics of appointments really uh, matters. The outgoing chair uh, was not very receptive to that kind of reform. It's not clear who the chair is going to be. Uh, that is an appointment that President Biden will need to make. And meanwhile, the acting chair, um, Chair uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel, is very friendly to Vermont and in fact has a, um, a property in Southern Vermont and has been very commendatory of Vermont's uh, mapping work, as has the Congress itself, which modeled some of its legislation on the work we did. So um, I think the move to the NTIA in part reflects um, prior years of uncertainty about whether the FCC would get with the program and fix its mapping problems. Um, now we've suddenly had a sea change with the federal election. That's why there's some mystery about what comes next. Thank you, that's helpful. My last question was just, um, do, we, do we know or can you reiterate the timeline for, for phase two of the RDOF? Yeah, it's gonna be in years six through 10 of the program. Um, so that's two, 2027 to 2031. Um, oh, we, okay. don't, we don't know yet who's eligible in, in phase two. And I do not believe we know what amount of money will be available for phase two? They said, we'll just spend the balance of whatever we didn't spend in phase one on phase two. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. That's it. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so um, first of all, I'll shed a little light on census blocks because I was a uh, uh, <laughs> worker on, on the 2010 census. But a census block is essentially defined by, it's, it's an island of land that's bounded by either roads or a road and a municipal boundary or, or a physical boundary like a stream or um, a lake or something like that. So you should be able to circumnavigate a census block um, unless it's intersected by a boundary like that. Uh, city block is one example. Um, in a rural area, you can have a very large census block with some additional roads going into it, uh, which, um, which don't actually intersect with another road. Um, and uh, if you, you definitely, if you've got a census block, people on one side of the road would be in one census block, <clears throat> and on the other side of the road, be, they'd be in a completely different census block. So uh, it's, it's really complicated, but it's, uh, it's got some logic to it. The, um, uh, so I do have, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, June talking about the new administration coming in. And I would recommend that uh, we get with our congressional delegation and try to, uh, try to coordinate um, the, the, the RDOF program under the Department of Agriculture with, uh, local or state um, efforts to get broadband out. I'm in regular contact with the federal delegation. Thank you. And of course, with my colleagues in the cabinet. So your instincts very well uh, directed. Representative Sevilla and then Representative Pat. Yes, uh, thank you. Just a couple of points of clarification um, from a little ways back. Um, 
uh, just, you know, uh, I think the commissioner's point about um, our need to understand we have to persuade our private sector, um, our private sector uh, partners in order to, to, uh, to get them to work with the CUDs um, is really important for us to understand. Um, you know, I would note that it is our um, complete lack of ability to persuade them <coughs> to, uh, to cover, uh, to cover uh, all Vermonters that has actually led to the legislation that we passed in the last biennium and will fuel um, legislation that we pass in this biennium. So always hopeful for persuasion, but I don't think we can count on being able to persuade. Uh, and then, uh, you know, again, with, uh, with the New Hampshire model that we have seen and which we talked about um, last year in our committee, um, you know, partnering those, uh, you know, some pretty innovative public-private partnerships. Um, Mr. Chair, I hope that's something that we'll be able to talk about and kind of think about with, uh, with both the CUDs and the providers and whether or not those types of models are helpful to getting uh, service in a complete CUD area or if they uh, detract and if there's ways to um, incent or encourage uh, those types of partnerships to be um, done in a way that um, helps get uh, all of the areas in a CUD as opposed to, you know, further exacerbates the problem. So I just want to book that, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair, for further discussion um, during this session. Thank you. Abram? Yes. Um, am I muted or can you hear? No. No, nope, we can muted. hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to. Uh, I, I fully understand the um, the lim the limitations and the sort of uh, very bizarre uh, patchwork way that uh, that that this works out and the limitations that we have in Vermont um, uh, to. Uh, control or direct how this federal program works. I just need to register that when I look at this map, um, uh, and particularly in the, the the parts of the state that I'm most familiar with, uh, this feels like it perpetuates the problem um, and and makes it uh, even harder to to. It, there will be people served by it, but it makes it even harder. Uh, to get to get to everyone, I'm looking at towns where the 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 regardless of which provider it is, um, the location where they're going to do where something will happen, um, uh, it appears to be um, uh, close to the main roads. Um, you know, maybe a little bit further out than than they than they are now. And in other cases, um, uh, towns are basically uh, unserved in the next town. Uh, almost all of all of it is served, and I just uh, it, this is um, it, it, it's just very frustrating to to look at this map. It's like uh, upside down and backwards to me. This is it's 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 all wrong, and I hope that uh, with new leadership we we can uh, figure out ways to um, uh, to do to do this better. I'm done. It sounds like you were a bug on the wall in my conversations with the FCC, Avram. <laughs> um, so we've, we've had a number of conversations on ARDOF. I, I wanna leave this open, um, Clay and June, for you to, um, uh, if there's any concluding remarks you wanna make about ARDOF, it's certainly something that we're gonna be picking away at with different witnesses in the coming weeks. But if there's, if there's any concluding remarks you wanna make on this before we turn to um, the connectivity yeah. initiative. The, the only observation I would offer is that uh, when the department was visiting with you last spring with the emergency broadband access plan, and we had the second part of that plan that uh, envisioned our own reverse auction at the state level, should we get considerable uh, federal funding, uh, ARDOF was uh, an acronym that featured quite prominently in that plan. And back in April and May, it was uh, an acronym with very limited content. 
um, now we have that content here and that suggests that there's a further need to uh, refine our thinking around um, what could be done with federal funding if we were to get some, which is more likely now than say uh, before the, the election. So this just is another reminder of how fluid the situation is, which is why open communication and um, you know working together in good faith and collaboration is so very important so that we can you know, make the optimal decisions here. So um, I just wanted to give the committee members uh, who were here last spring comfort that the department isn't dug into any one perspective. And for the new members um, to tee that up a little bit for you so that you're aware that there is this emergency broadband action plan out there that the department's been working on. It's a work in progress. And here we now have a vital piece of information the other observation I would make is that um, I'm very proud of those blue blobs on this map. Um, I, I know they complicate life to a certain extent, but that represents Team Vermont having put its best, best foot forward in the RDOF and um, a, a consortium of our CEDs, um, electric utilities and others came together and made that happen. And that to me is a promising sign of what Vermont can do when it uh, puts its mind to it. Mr. Chair, I can't see who has their hands up. May I? Uh, you have your hand up, I see. Okay. <laughs> Go may ahead, I Laura. Just, may yeah. I just, so, you know, I think that um, I love the commissioner's uh, citing, you know, of the Team Vermont approach. Um, really important, I think, and different. Um, than some of the other approaches that we see, the places where we try to persuade. And, you know, in this Team Vermont, the blue, the CUDs were a part of this. So the CUDs who have stepped forward to say, we will figure out how to get to the last mile were a part of this. That is important. Catherine, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, or, or maybe just a clarification. As a, as a member of the um, NEK CUD, um, we, we were not a member of the NRTC consortium. Um, that was a you know, deliberate decision not, not to, uh, to sort of wait to see how, how the results um, of, of RDOF played out. And, and I think gets to some of the other points about um, you know, how, as we move forward, um, can we work with CUDs to think about the multiple different roles that CUDs can play to hopefully ensure last mile service. Um, so just wanted to clarify that, um, as I think others have mentioned, the NEK map has gotten pretty complicated um, with all of these different partners and the RDOF awards and what that means for the long-term business model and viability um, for the NEK CUD, but I think we're, um, speaking for myself, not the CUD, you know, excited about how hopefully that creates more opportunities. And, uh, you know, it's a complicated map, but um, looking forward to our continued conversations about how we make this all happen. You know, it's really great, too, to have uh, you here, Catherine, as a somebody who brings the perspective of one of those entities to the policy work that your committee is going to have to do. So it's, uh, things are just in such a state of flux that uh, we, I think, I know I benefit from the, the experience and perspective you bring to bear. So um, Clay and June, why don't we turn to um, the connectivity initiative? This is obviously a, something that's, that's quite related, but um, it's a program that's been in, in, uh, in place in Vermont for a number of years now. Um, and again, for the kind of foundational education of the committee, um, especially as we embark on some of the work uh, we're gonna be doing in the coming months, hopefully to accelerate broadband deployment. I think it's important um, for the committee to have a refresher on that program, what it can and can't do, um, you know, where the funding come from, it comes from. Um, and again, just to, just to lay a foundation of knowledge for the committee um, on, that, on that particular program. So I'm going to ask Clay to go through that, um, but the prefatory remark I want to make for the committee is that this thing was established, I think, in 2014, yeah. and it's now um, 2021, 
and um, that seems like a century ago. This, in, in terms of telecommunications policy, this is already an old program. And so it's a, a good moment now to relook it and to say, does this uh, you know, still fit our needs or does it need uh, some revision in light of the um, material developments, principally the CUD deployments um, that have happened in just the, the last year? Go ahead, Clay. Sure, thank you. Um, before I start talking about the connectivity initiative, I just did, wanted to share this map. This map um, is uh, what you get when you uh, take out RDOF served areas and area and locations served by um, by our grant uh, connectivity initiative uh, using the CRF money. Um, this is the forty six thousand locations um, that don't have twenty five three after those programs are um, accounted for. We've broken it down by town, so I know in the past we've shown you a map of um, blobs, uh, not blob dots, little tiny dots um, uh, that are almost unreadable at a state level. We're, we're trying to make it a little more readable by um, uh, quantifying number of locations that are unserved by town. Um, so obviously towns with more locations, um, you know, look, um, more dire, but they are more sometimes more populated. Like if you look at Northfield, for instance. Um, so uh, here's the legends: the number of uh, unserved locations at 25.3, um, and you can kind of get a sense of um, kind of where the the hot spots are going to be um, um, uh, for future connectivity initiative. Um, uh, Rounds. So let me switch to <clears throat> uh, this. Um, again, this is a write-up, uh, a short memo on the connectivity initiative. Um, it's a grant program. Um, it requires us to do the kind of mapping we do. So figure out where broadband is, where it's not. Uh, technically, the statute requires us to do that by census block. Um, we do publish the, uh, what census block each location is in, but we've, um, unlike the FCC, we've abandoned the census block approach um, for um, various reasons. The biggest being that census blocks bear no relationship to the way networks are designed and deployed. Um, so we've had more than one uh, instance where the carrier is going to serve an entire census block they have to somehow figure out how to get over a mountain where there is no road. They have to go outside of their exchange and come back in or something like that. It just makes no sense um, from the standpoint of, um, uh, of uh, deploying a broadband network. So we do it based on location. We publish a list of eligible locations. Um, when we, we did the, the summer program, there was 69,000 locations that were eligible. Um, when we do uh, the next round of connectivity initiative, we'll publish the 46,000 locations. Um, we are then required to uh, issue an RFP um, that uh, seeks bids to serve these locations. And when we review those bids, uh, we are to give priority to proposals that reflect the lowest cost of providing services to unserved and underserved locations. So, um, you can understand why wireless um, fared well, it's cheaper than um, fiber to the home. Um, we um, also consider these uh, other uh, items, uh, proposed data transfer rates. So um, we, we prefer fiber um, over uh, other technologies where we can. Um, and in the last round, we gave a multiplier to fiber projects. Um, the price to consumers, um, the proposed costs to consumers of any new construction equipment or installation, uh, whether the proposal would use the best available technology that is economically feasible. Uh, that could mean lots of different things to different people. Uh, the availability of service of comparable quality and speed and the objectives of the state's telecommunications plan. Um, 
when we do these projects, um, we typically give grantees one year from the execution of the grant agreement to complete construction. Um, we ask them, not ask them, but obligate them to provide continuous service for five years. Um, uh, we pay actual costs of construction, so it's not, um, you know, there's a profit built into the grants. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> um, that's pretty much it. It's a very straightforward program. Um, it's very much in line with what programs in other states. Uh, as you mentioned, Massachusetts had a program that's very similar. Maine has a program that works um, a lot like this. Wisconsin, uh, Tennessee. Um, this is the um, uh, kind of predominant way that states um, uh, address uh, broadband. Um, I've provided tables for the last rounds. Um, these are the state funded connectivity initiatives. So we are, we're not talking about CRF here. Um, as you can see um, at the time, 2016, we were funding projects at, at 10 megabits per second. Uh, so there, there are a few DSL projects in there. Um, there's a lot of fiber though. Um, again, fiber, some cable, um, cables had a, um, a role in, in, um, in our connectivity initiative. Um, so even though it doesn't technically meet the 100-100, um, it gets pretty close and um, we've done some good projects with cable companies. Um, and again, um, this doesn't, uh, uh, again, we, we're doing fiber to the home via DSL, Plus two is uh, is uh, twenty five two service. It's not quite twenty five three, um, but um, uh, it was uh, it's it's pretty close. So we've done a couple of those projects. So um, overall, fiber to the premises where we can, but um, it's open to any provider. We're technology agnostic um, as long as it meets the the required service uh, metrics. Um, as I pointed out earlier, uh, wireless is something that we've traditionally not done uh, through the connectivity initiative. So um, this latest round using the CRF money was um, uh, our first foray into doing large scale wireless projects. Did, did the work done in 2000, 2020 through the connectivity initiative um, there's no uh, 2020 awards here. Was that essentially because the, the work of the department um, and the connectivity initiative was directed towards the CRF uh, project? Yes, yeah, yeah. so we did have a connectivity initiative in 2020, but it was funded through CRF. So I have it on the other memo and not this one. This is only using state money. Um, the, the program is funded through the Vermont Universal Service Fund. Um, so that's a 2.4% charge under telephone service. So we're taking um, telephone subscriber money and applying it to broadband. The Universal Service Fund also funds uh, E911, which takes the lion's share of the fund. Um, telecommunications Relay Service, that's uh, a service for uh, deaf, hard of hearing folks uh, to use uh, telephone service. Um, and then we have a, we have a state um, lifeline subsidy for telephone service as well. Uh, and the fund funds all of those programs. Um, in 2019, the legislature dedicated um, a portion of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the state USF to specifically to broadband. Um, and that has been building up and we now have uh, a little over 2 million um, so um, we are, we have a draft RFP ready to go in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we'd like to put that out and um, continue doing um, connectivity initiative projects using that state money. Catherine? Yeah, thanks for this. Sort of similar to my question around the line extension program. Um, I assume there's some mapping of this so that you can see the, uh, you know, where the connectivity initiative has made the biggest dent in terms of reaching underserved folks. And do we find it similar to what I think I heard you say about the line extension program that it, um, sort of where there's already 
service this is extending that existing service um, or is um, through the criteria and prioritization are we um, you know making a significant dent in the sort of farthest out most underserved areas um, certainly um, the connectivity initiative contemplates uh, the, the, the expansion of existing networks so um, that has typically meant that um, where you already have a network and you have a participating ISP, um, you're, you're going to see those bids. So if there's no participating ISP in a town, we're, we're not going to see a proposal from them. We're going to leave that town behind. Um, the key difference between LECAP and connectivity initiative is that LECAP is consumer driven. The, consumer files an application and under this program, it's the ISP. So there's more leeway for the ISP to say, where do we want to go? Um, you know, Consolidated has a presence everywhere in its territory because it has to offer telephone service. So that's where DSL has um, had a role is, is, is in reaching those really hard to reach areas. Um, that project in, in Barnet, uh, for instance, um, so, you know, uh, this one here. Um, oh, we're, we're still seeing your word. You know, there, there was no other provider e even close, uh, you know, in that area. And that was actually a project where Consolidated had worked with a neighborhood. And the neighborhood had put some money in, Consolidated had put its, a lot of its own money in um, to drive down that per location cost. Um, so that, you know, that's. Um, that's an example of kind of a, of, a, of a far out area. But, you know, when you, when you talk about favoring fiber, that really limits the number of providers that, that can take advantage. And so you'll see we've given a lot of money to EC Fiber because they are a fiber provider. They have a presence in the Upper Valley. So um, where we're seeing a lot of these grants go to the Upper Valley area. Um, as you can see here, uh, in fact, I believe everything uh, but maybe Cavendish is considered Upper Valley um, in, this, in this award. So, um, you know, the, um, we, we are left to choosing uh, between projects that, um, you know, we get bids for. And, uh, yeah, we would like to see more done uh, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom, but, um, we have to have a provider up there willing to do it. Para Networks is an example, you know, um, with the Craftsbury project, um, and I think you're a, a Para Networks customer. Um, you know, his, his network is is largely um, state funded, in that um, there's utilization of the the state fiber network, and um, he's taken advantage of grants that we've provided. Um, so. Um, so it's all about having a provider there to do the work. Yeah, that that certainly seems like an important piece of this. So thanks for that clarification. I think it would be helpful to see a visual um, summary. So of, I, I earlier I put a link in the chat for the line extension uh, depiction, and I'm about to put a link in the chat for the connectivity initiative that was funded through the CRF as well. Is that what you're looking for, Representative Sims? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, great. We'll get that for you. One additional follow-up. Um, Clay, um, Commissioner Tooney, um, could you just speak a little bit to the role of the TCAB um, in, in the Connectivity Grant Initiative and any reflections on the... Yes, I, I can speak to that. Um, the TCAB, like the Connectivity Initiative Program, is a relatively new institution, and I first began working with it when I came on board in 2017. And I think uh, if you listen to testimony, it was given last uh, September in Senate Finance um, by your colleague, um, Evan Carlson, I think. Um, the, there's a recognition all around that the institution is growing and coming into its own. And speaking for myself through the um, Connectivity Initiative Program and the CRF, period. Uh, 
I think you froze up, Commissioner. Can you hear us? Commissioner Tierney. All right. Um, why don't we put that question on ice, Catherine, uh, until the commissioner can can rejoin us or uh, clicks Only back in. Decent internet in this state, you know? Exactly. exactly. He has EC fiber. <laughs> Um, Catherine, why don't you hold on to that question? And um, Lucy, I think you were next. Uh, if you've got a question and maybe Clay can address it. Great, thanks. Um, I just had one question. If I'm reading the memos correctly, it's giving me the impression that the department is considering uh, addresses that have been the recipient of the ARDOF money as served when it looks at how to pay, um, how to, allocate grants going forward. And that concerns me on two reasons. The first is that if the build out timeline is six years, I think we in the state have a pretty strong understanding that these locations need broadband faster than six years. And then the second is that there's a pretty strong history of federal grant money for serving addresses not coming through in the way that has been allocated. So I guess I just want to clarify, am I reading correctly in understanding that the going forward, it's the intent of the department to consider those unserved or underserved addresses that have been the recipient of, recipient of RDOF money to be served as far as allocating grants. Um, we think that's the best approach at this time. Um, and, and here's why. Um, you still have 46,000 addresses that uh, do not um, have a funded solution in place. And um, the, the amount of funding that we have, say two, two million, um, you know, we can do some vacations with that amount of money. Um, so, you know, if we had the money to do 46,000 locations and then some, um, I, I take your point. Uh, we, we would be better to get them broadband today than um, leave, leave it to um, RDOF to serve them. But, you know, the, the need to so uh, greatly um, uh, outweighs the resources that we have at this time that um, it's been our focus to really um, uh, hone in our resources on areas that we know won't see any funding whatsoever. Um, it, it's unfortunate because six years is a long time, um, but you, you've got uh, 46,000 addresses that might never see anything, um, at least that we're, we're aware of at this point. Um, you know, if, if you just give us uh, $284 million, we'll do every one. That's all we need. Um, so. so, Mr. Chair. Is that Laura? It is. May I? Uh, I don't know. What, what, do, you, do you have a question? I, I just want to comment on the $280 million that we just need it given to us. Um, I don't. I, I, I was, I'm sorry. I was being a bit sarcastic. I, I just. Okay. Well, think I think, yep, yeah, I understand. And I just want to. Um, you know, that, that can be really uh, disheartening and feel overwhelming. Um, I think that there is a real opportunity here based on the work that hundreds of Vermont, talented Vermont volunteers are doing to actually put together the plans to get to the last mile. And the, and the Vermonters that live in those places, um, I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity that we have to leverage um, existing funding and to bring in funds to get this done now that we are actually, you know, creating uh, these plans on, on, on how to do it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and 280 million is a lot less than what we were hearing, you know, two and three years ago. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I am not uh, intimidated by that number in any way. I, yeah, I, I, I take your point, it gets better every year um, I, I think it's just a matter of um, where you spend state resources. Um, I mean, it would be great if we could use 
you know, state resources to hit those, um, those areas that are not um, funded by RDOF, it might, that are next to those areas that are funded by RDOF, it might uh, help accelerate um, RDOF deployment. Um, it might um, it, it might help make RDOF uh, more feasible for um, some of those um, RDOF recipients. Um, who, who knows? But the um, funding, uh, say, a fiber to the premises solution um, in an RDOF eligible area. Um, I guess the concern from our end is. Uh, you, are you providing two fiber connections or are you subsidizing um, uh, what should be paid for through RDOF uh, to the detriment of people who, who do not have um, a solution through RDOF or some other um, federal or state um, program uh, or, or private solution? Um, that's, our, that's our biggest concern. Um, I think one point that should be made about RDOF that um, we haven't said yet is that it's it's not really um, it's not really a, a capital uh, program. It's not it's not really paying for construction. Um, the companies are see, uh, receiving ongoing support for a ten year period to maintain service at those locations. So how they build it, how they pay for it, is their problem they're getting a subsidy to maintain and operate service in, in those areas. Um, so they have, a, they have a requirement to do it and um, they are getting paid to keep that service going. Um, so it, it's, not, um, it's, it's not just a matter of providing them with the money to, to build it, it's, it's more than that. Um, Whereas our program is simply a capital construction program. We're just paying people to, to construct facilities to, to provide the service. And it's, and it's also a grant program as opposed to um, dollars that could be leveraged by um, recipients. And again, on the smallest scale, uh, that, that might not be an efficient way to use these dollars, but um, you know, Another concept that at least is, is floating around my head, how can we turn $2 million um, into $8 million of project financing costs? But um, that's a longer discussion. Um, we've got 17 minutes left. Um, Commissioner Tierney, you were in the middle of answering a question from uh, Representative Sims, and we lost you. I'm sorry to say, but you're back. Not at all. Um, not, not at all. And um, it's given me time to distill my thoughts. It, it's a helpful and I think um, useful institution, Representative Sims, it has some growing pains and happily CRF required us to do some of that growing. Uh, we're not done improving how we work yet with VCAB and the department, but uh, it gets stronger every day if that's um, of any comfort to you. Yeah, the other thing I just, I, I just wanna mention very quickly, I'm sorry, is that uh, to Representative Sevilla's point, uh, I continue to ask the federal delegation at every opportunity. My most recent one came in uh, January, this month actually, um, no, late December, uh, to, make, to make the ask for the $300 million that will solve all our problems. So um, never fear the ask is being made. Representative Sims, I'm sorry, you and I have overlapped there. Um. Yeah, thanks, and um, totally understand. New things take take time to um, uh, to, to get the flow down. I, I guess I'm curious if there's anything specific that you'd point to about opportunities for growth or um, ways to really maximize the um, uh, usefulness of TCAB and how it relates with the department and provides feedback on grants and, and other components of the work. Uh, would you mind terribly if I thought about that a little bit and maybe we uh, had an offline conversation about it? Of course. Or uh, as, as the chair prefers, I, I, it's an important issue because it goes to um, the public oversight aspect and input um, before the, the CEDs became so robust. Um, TCA was really the only place where the department got um, input from outside the department 
um, as to what it was doing with the connectivity initiative grants. And I especially, I can think of one meeting in particular this past summer that was very, very um, instructive for how the model can work where uh, the department had certain ideas. We talked with VCAB, it was very clear that TCAB saw it differently and persuasively so. And that was a very helpful redirection. But um, I wouldn't be prepared to say much more beyond that right now. Representative Yen Tachka. Um, yeah, um, on the connectivity uh, initiative, if there is a neighborhood that is willing to uh, contribute to a build out, to the broadband build out, can they apply to the con connectivity initiative for a subsidy to help them fund that? Um, I'm going to take a shot at that because I don't see Clay anywhere. It's uh, I oh, there you are, Clay. But I'll I'll take a pass at it and use weigh in as you see fit, Clay. Um, it's a grant program, so we put out a request for proposal, and uh, those proposals need to be responsive to the RFP. And what you've described is a particular entity that has identified a a need it has of its um, you know that the, is organic to where its situation is. Uh, so it would need to squeeze itself into the demands of the RFP in order to be able to apply to the, um, the connectivity initiative for a grant. And I'm, I'm guessing, Mike, that that's not a good fit, but maybe uh, Clay would know more. The uh, connectivity initiative is open to, um, to uh, internet service providers. So they have to be the applicant. They're, they're the ones bidding. Um, so so if, you, if, if you're not an internet service provider, we, we can't technically accept your application. Where things have worked, um, I would cite two examples. One was in Cavendish where the town worked with Comcast um, uh, to provide service uh, and um, uh, Comcast was the applicant, but they worked hand in hand with the town. Barnett with Consolidated, um, that neighborhood I was discussing earlier. Um, I think there've been a, a few other examples, um, West uh, Craftsbury, West Craftsbury again, um, where the town um, worked with pair networks and, um, and we were able to contribute to a larger project. Um, I think those are examples where um, a partnership between a neighborhood and a, um, a carrier has worked out well. Um, but, you know, there's no formal process to that. We've, we've tried best as we can to pair um, providers with um, interested folks. The LECAP okay. project was different in that that was applicant driven. Um, and, and so that, that is where we had neighborhoods applying and, and getting line extensions. So the uh, neighborhood would have to basically work with their provider and um, convince them to put in to to um, put in a proposal under the RFP in order to get that done. Yes. Okay. Um, I, and I think you know certainly a lot of the smaller carriers um, I think have done um, are, are able to do that uh, as well. So Waitsfield, Champlain Valley, NEC Fiber, um, two examples of providers that have worked um, with the town or with the neighborhood um, to do a project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Chase. Uh, quick one, Clay, I haven't heard um, any updates on Starlink since uh, your team took over um, and they started dealing with you guys directly. I was wondering if you could give us like a quick snapshot of um, what's going on with that and how that might dovetail in with some of these conversations, please. Sure. Um, we've had a few conversations with Starlink, um, uh, floated some ideas. They've shared some data with us um, under an NDA. Um, so um, things are moving along. Uh, nothing definitive to report. Um, I don't have much to, uh, to say to you today, but um, we are having uh, continued conversations, and um, I'm hopeful we can do something with Starlink this year. Uh, would you be willing to elaborate on your level of optimism on that front? 
cautiously optimistic. Um, Thank you. Great. I, I don't see any other hands up, but we've got a few more minutes here. Um, what I, what I want to use this conversation and the background and the updates that we've gotten from uh, from Clay and the commissioner today on really is a springboard into the discussion we're having tomorrow morning. Um, tomorrow morning, we are going to have testimony from a, a variety of folks representing um, CUDs from around the state. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, Rob Fish is going to open our discussion with uh, some background on um, what the Department of Public Service has been doing in supporting and uh, accelerating the work of CUDs in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, Rob's position is one that this com committee had done a, a good deal of work on last uh, session um, to fund through Act 79. Um, my sense and understanding is that it's been um, a, a very productive resource for CUDs. And um, uh, I don't have the final head count yet, but in addition to Rob, I'm hoping we're going to have a representative from some, if not all, of the CUDs from around the state to hear what they've been working on in the last year and what their outlook is for, let's say, the next 12 months um, in terms of the work that they have in front of them, how they've been using some of the um, strategic resources that we have appropriated uh, for their uh, for their utility in the last, I guess it's the last year, maybe it's uh, 18 months. Um, and also want to hear some of the things that policymakers, um, including the members on this committee, can do to accelerate their work. Um, we have put a lot of, uh, of eggs in the CUD basket to help our state overcome some of the um, uh, seemingly insurmountable connectivity issues that we have in certain pockets of the state, but they are uh, really in all parts of the state. And, um, you know, as has been said several times today, we are putting a lot of, um, uh, we are putting a lot of weight on the backs of, of volunteers um, to do this work and how can we better support them both in terms of strategic resources, but then also in terms of financial resources to, to leverage the very limited resources that they currently have. So that is gonna be the, the backdrop of tomorrow's discussion, again, with, um, uh, with representatives from the Department of Public Service and CUDs from around the state. Um, Representative Sibeli, I see your hands up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to check in. I see on our agenda tomorrow uh, that we are starting with the CUDs at nine. And I just want to clarify how long we will be going with them. Will we be going straight through noon with them? Is that the intention? Yeah, so, yep. so similar to our hearing this morning, I'm anticipating that, that uh, tomorrow's discussion will, will probably be broken into three parts. Um, I've asked Rob Fish to give the committee some background on the work uh, that he has been doing in the last year to 18 months. Um, and essentially the, the money that we, um, uh, that we appropriated through Act 79, uh, what, that, you know, what, that, what that money is doing in supporting the work of the department. Um, so that's kind of the introduction. Um, the, the, the meat, if you will, is going to be hearing from our CUDs. Um, and I've asked each CUD representative that can be here to give us, again, there's nine CUDs, so we can't take 20 minutes with each, but I'm hoping we can take, you know, five or so minutes to get a little background on what they've been doing, some of the challenges they face, and what their outlook is for the coming year. And again, I think there's a, a real variety of the different levels of evolution of, of, um, of these different CUDs. So that's gonna be kind of the meat of the sandwich, if you will. And then the, uh, the other, uh, uh, I, I think the final um, discussion piece is going to be hearing from um, a couple of the CUD leaders from the Vermont CUD Association, uh, which you know, is, are gonna be people in the room, um, to hear about what are the things that the CUDs have collectively consulted on our priorities our policy priorities, how we can support their work, um, whether it's financially, whether it's from a, a policy or regulatory standpoint. Um, 
and this is this is their opportunity when well, they'll have certainly have others but tomorrow is an opportunity for them uh in front of the microphone to to um to talk to some of those things so it's really going to be a three-part um uh session great uh so i'm going to bring our our hearing this morning to a close i want to again thank uh the commissioner and clay again not only for your time today but for your work in the last um, six months um, again acknowledging it's been a herculean task and the, the task in front of us is also herculean um, but really appreciate the um, the overview and the advice you give to this committee um, we're going to be calling on you uh, not only tomorrow but in the weeks ahead and um, I really appreciate your time this morning so members of the committee um, we'll see you at 115 on the floor